Welcome to the blind zone. What is a blind zone, you say? It's something that comes upon you all of a sudden, or it's something you refuse to see that was right in front of your face. And today I think is probably one of the most important episodes of the blind zone I've ever done because it's so close to my heart and near and dear to who I am and what I believe. I'm going to tell you the story today of how I ended up at North Point Community Church and what happened once I got there and why I'm committed to staying there. So it all started when I lived in Tennessee. I found a program on the radio and Andy Stanley was the, he was giving a message and I heard it. Well, he really intrigued me because what he said was scripturally based, practically motivated, and you could apply it. It was very applicable. So I started to listen to everything he did, and I really, really liked his messages. So my husband and I were regular listeners and contributors, and occasionally we'd even drive to Alpharetta to, to go to North Point Church in person. So anyway, my husband had been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and one afternoon, very late, in the progression of his disease, he and I were sitting in the front bedroom of our home and we were looking out the window at the winter barren landscape. And he asked me, what is it you're going to do? We both knew what he was talking about. And I said, well, if at all possible, I would like to move to Alpharetta to go to North Point. And he said, I wouldn't have expected anything less. And we never spoke of it again. I never really told anybody about that desire because I wanted to make sure that I was, you know, thinking clearly. My husband died in February of 2018. And uh, a little bit after that, I had started to pray and I, and I asked God, I said, you know, God, I would really like to move to Alpharetta. And if you let me do that, I'm going to lead a fearless life for Christ. But because I'm blind and I don't drive, you're going to have to arrange the transportation because I just thought that that would be confirmation that this just isn't what I wanted. This is something that he was going to let me do. But I did, you know, finish praying that, but if you didn't want me to move to Alpharetta and you wanted me to stay here and shrivel up like a race, and I would do that too. So I gave God the choice of, you know, letting me move or letting me stay, but I was going to be bound by whatever he chose for me. The next morning, I got a text from a friend, and she said, hey, do you want to take a ride out to Roswell and look around? I said, absolutely. Now, I could really tell you all the ins and outs of this very fabulous story, but for time constraints, I'm just going to skip to the, the chase here. So we went down in May. I found an apartment. I came home, put my house on the market. It sold within a day, and by July 10th, I was where I had asked God to take me to Alpharetta, Georgia. So because I was blind and I didn't really know anybody in the area, God provided a way in just, just many, many miraculous ways. And it was all God's hand was on the whole thing. So I got involved with North Point and I, I was a starting point leader and I led some small groups. And one of the things that really I, I really appreciated about North Point, North Point Church was that they were the church for the unchurched. So it wasn't your traditional, we always sing these songs, we always pray these prayers. It was a more flexible environment, but it was still scripturally sound. In fact, the tagline is, we want you to become, we want you to follow Jesus because I always scoop that up. We want you to follow Jesus because following Jesus makes you better at life and makes life better for you or something similar to that. But anyway, follow Jesus. And so I liked the atmosphere. I liked the fact that what the messages were about were about how to follow Jesus. But again, they were very practical and very applicable. And I'll tell you two instances because I could give you I could give you two hours of Andyisms because my friends and family are so tired of me saying, oh, Andy did a message. Andy had a book. Andy did a... And one of the books I recommend from Andy, and I bought more copies of these and gave them out, 
was Andy's book on principles of the path because your destination, I'm sorry, your direction, not intention, determine your direction. Oh, I goofed that up. Sorry. <laughs> your direction, not intention, determine your destination. True. Sorry about that. Anyway, so the two, and, and whenever anybody was having a problem, I'd be like, oh, Andy has a message for that. And I'd shoot him off the link. But the two things that really stayed with me was I was making a couple of unwise decisions. They weren't bad, but they weren't going to end up well. And the Holy Spirit told me, watch guardrails part one. And I thought, well, that was pretty specific. So I turned it on and it exactly, exactly identified my situation. And I knew that that was right from, that was right from the Holy Spirit. And I changed course, uh, I course corrected. And the next one was my cousin and I were in Jackson Hole, Wyoming in August of 2021. And Andy started a sermon series, Your Integrity, Our World. And this message on August 22nd of 2021 was the future, your future for a bowl of stew. And in it, he clearly laid out what it is to have an appetite versus integrity. And while I knew that, it was a framework for which I then could sift out things that I saw that came after that. And I would say, oh, this is appetite. And I knew exactly what to do with it. Oh, this is integrity. And I knew better how to act. So those were two, two very specific things that really helped me immensely. And there's many, many more examples. But you get the point. So that was how I got to North Point, And that was how North Point has changed me. And now I'm going to tell you why I'm staying at North Point. North Point, again, is church for the unchurched. And they are, when Jesus said, all who are heavy laden, you know, come unto me. North Point means all. It doesn't, they don't have a, a sin scale at the door that you have to, you know, apply for a grant or anything. They just let you in. And because they really do want you to follow Jesus. So the atmosphere is a little more relaxed. And I had started to see online a number of months ago that people were just trashing Andy over his stance on gays and the LBGTQ. And I didn't know what his stance was because I had never heard it. So I let it go, but I just kept seeing these things pop up and pop up. And then there was a couple of disparaging uh, videos saying that now he was hosting a conference celebrating the gay lifestyle. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound like Andy, but you know, whatever. So my prayer posse and I got together and we started to pray. We prayed for the conference and we prayed for the truth of the situation to be made known. We, we prayed and the day of the Thursday and Friday of the conference, we were in prayer. And then on at the end of it, you know, we, we had just prayed. On that next Monday, Andy had sent out an email that said, I'm going to do a message on October 1st, and I'm going to discuss the conference. And so again, my prayer posse and I got together and we prayed and prayed that on that Sunday, the truth would be known. And so most of the members of the prayer posse and I went to church that morning and again, we covered it in prayer and we trusted that, you know, the Holy Spirit would reveal the truth and that we would see how our church stood on this very difficult topic. And Andy got up there and he, he's really a great communicator and he made us laugh and he made us think and, and his whole thing, and you can find this on YouTube and it's called, I love my church. And again, it was done on October 1st and he did not, uh, stream it. He just gave it to the people who were there and it was packed. It was more crowded than Christmas or even Easter. And he starts off by saying that he's never really confronted people who had something against him like he's doing, but he felt that there was a necessity to answer his critics. And what he said after that just shocked, delighted, and amazed me because he said back in 2014, 
um, you have to understand that North Point Community Church has a very robust youth youth ministry all the way from babies all the way to I think college but definitely high school and they found in 2014 that the middle school students were asking the leaders what do I do with my same-sex attraction and to our church's credit they didn't tell those kids you're not allowed to think like that let's read the Bible and see how bad of a sinner you are they said, and they asked the leadership in our church, what do we do with this? And I got to tell you that I was, I was so pleased and proud of our church that those youth trusted these adults in their life enough to even broach that topic. Because in a few weeks, I'm going to do a message and it's going to be throwing stones part two where i talked about how i had to lie to get into a church because i couldn't be honest with them about my my sins and problems so i was so thrilled that these youth felt comfortable enough with these adults to bear their honest problems then i was even more proud that they again didn't discourage them tell them stop thinking like that that they set about to find a way to bridge the gap not not so much that they can say oh we think what you're doing is great but to just give them a place and a space to talk through their feelings so andy and a team of people got together and they wrote out a curriculum and what really impressed me is when andy said what happens in that community is when the gay person comes out of the closet the parents go in and shut the door so that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants them all to be isolated, separated from themselves, and to just have their own thoughts and their opinions about what's happening. And Andy said, we couldn't let that happen. So we gave parents an avenue that they could talk to other parents, and they were not alone. And this started uh, a nationwide movement, a digital movement, to just have the parents of these same-sex attracted students have a place to talk about their children. So for me, that said a lot about our church, that they took, a, they took what was a very volatile, volatile topic, everybody has an opinion, and they looked at it from the compassionate eyes of Christ and said, we're not going to push you out of the church you're as welcome to be here as anybody else. We want to support you. We want to support your parents so that the family unit is kept intact. And so how the conference came about was the two people who were heading the digital national group said, can we just have a conference at North Point? And Andy said, sure. So there were two days of events planned. And because of all the, the pushback, some people dropped out, but the conference took place anyway. The conference was well attended, and according to you know what I've heard, it was very, very helpful. Because what the conference was not, was it was not telling the people struggling with same-sex attractions how to, how to make good on that or anything. They were just building a bridge between the parents and the students. As these parents needed help. So I was very, again, proud of my church for doing that. And so then, and at the end of the, the talk by Andy, you know, I love my church. He said, we still believe marriage is between a man and a woman. And we believe that sex outside of marriage is not in anybody's best interest. So he was very clear on that, what the conference was about, why, what precipitated the whole start of the thing, you know, and the, and the need by the, the children. And so I was just thrilled. And by the end of it, I, I sat there just sobbing at how proud I was that we took a very difficult topic. We took a stance and we did it under the guise of having compassion instead of criticism. So then I was like, well, that is fabulous. Now that everybody knows, they're going to see that what we did wasn't a bad thing. It was a great thing. But that wasn't the reality at all. 
I was shocked, shocked, shocked to see all the vitriol that now was pouring out. And I thought about that and I thought, well, a couple of things came to mind. When you enter Christ as a, as a believer, you are then embodied in the whole church of Christ. And God doesn't, God hates the, the disunity in his body. And all these naysayers and thrown, stone throwers, they were just bringing up the disunity in the church and they were, they were carving out an us and them situation. And I was just so brokenhearted. And I thought about, you know, well, many scriptures came to mind, but I was thinking about in Acts chapter five, when Gamaliel was looking at the people who were trying to get Peter and the apostles to, you know, stop talking about Jesus. Gamaliel said to the authorities, you know, if this is from God, you're not going to be able to stop it. And in fact, then you'll be working against God. And if it's not from God, it'll take its own course. So I wished instead of everybody bashing Andy, they would have just taken Gamaliel's stance that God was big enough to handle himself and that God would have done what, what needed to be done to either stop Andy or encourage Andy. Because trust me, Andy's got a million people around him that, that he, they know what he's doing and that if they felt he was in the wrong, somebody would have said to him, Andy, Andy, we think you ought to reconsider this. But that wasn't the case at all. And the other thing I thought about was in the story where Jesus heals the, the man born blind and they, they bring his parents in and they say, well, how did your son get his sight and, and was he born blind? They were so terrified of being thrown out of the synagogue that they were like, well, just ask him. And I thought about that with people in your own congregation that who do have parents who have children who are same-sex attracted, you have now put them in the uncomfortable box of either dismissing their own children or being kicked out of the synagogue. And I just thought about the disunity and, and the deception that you're trying to build in your own members. And where's your compassion? And then I thought, out of all of it, the worst of it, is now that they have watched you trash a ministry because of what you feel you need to protect God and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit from the scriptural authenticity, that now that people are, are the members of your own body, the members in your own congregation, they're watching you trash another ministry and now I'm sure they feel compelled that they too are allowed to do that because they've witnessed that is now your legacy. So instead of staying in your lane and doing what it was you were supposed to do, you veered into somebody else's path and you decided for them what they were doing was wrong. I gotta tell you, my heart just breaks for that because if your circle is so narrow that you don't have people in your congregation who have children who are struggling with this, then your circle isn't big enough at all. Because, because what you're ultimately saying is if these kids came to you and said, Pastor, I'm really struggling with this, would you take them to the cross and say, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, but not for yours. Yours is just too big. And, and it's not up to you to do the job of the Holy Spirit in the transforming work of Christ. So I guess all this to say why I'm at North Point is because I believe in what they're doing. The messages have changed me and transformed me. His books have given me deeper understanding. In fact, his book on the book about enemies, he talks about anger. And I had something with anger a couple weeks ago. And I remember what he said in his book. And I thought about that, and he was right, and I resolved it. So I trusted Andy Stanley, and I believe his message is to be true, and I believe that he is a, a godly man, and that he hears from the Spirit, and that he did the exact right thing when it came to the students coming and asking for help with their same-sex attraction. 
So I went to North Point with a purpose. I'm staying with North Point because I'm proud of them. And all I'm asking is for those of you throwing stones at North Point that, like the woman caught in adultery, that if you're old enough and you look back at your own sins, you are not blameless, but Christ accepted you. So put down your rocks, stop throwing stones, stay in your own lane, minister to your congregation however you are being led, but stop, stop, stop being a disunifying part of a unified body. This has really been on my heart for a long time, and so I thank you for watching this. I know it's longer than I generally like, and I hope you've indulged me all the way to the end. And again, in a couple weeks, you'll see a message called Throwing Stones Part 2, where I talk about how I had to lie to get in the church and all the ramifications of that and how I'm at a place that I have grown, I'm thriving, and in the sanctification process, I'm growing deeper every day because I love the Lord and I love the Spirit and His corrections and His comfort. So again, thank you for going the distance. And um, next week on The Blind Zone is, is another interesting topic. But again, I'm not going to tell you who it is because in case something happens and it doesn't work out exactly right. But thank you. Thank you for coming along on the blind zone.